Welcome to the last video in the Technician Class License Exam Preparation course. This is the 21st and last video in the series. While this is the last video, the information in this video is very important. I'll be discussing safety issues. Every year, at least two amateur radio operators are killed and several more seriously injured while working on their equipment. I'd like for you not to be in that statistic. Electrical shock can be and often is fatal. Proper grounding is one way to prevent electrical shock. Three-way plugs, that is plugs that have the center ground pin, should be used on all equipment plugged into mains power. Further, a ground fault circuit interrupter socket should be part of the wiring in your shack. A GFCI detects when current flows on the neutral wire and immediately disconnects the circuit. Almost all amateur radio equipment in your ham shack, with the exception of your handheld radio, will have a place to attach a ground wire. Connecting all these grounding points to a common point and then connect that point to the green, that is the ground wire and the house wiring, will keep all of the chassis in the shack at the same zero volt voltage level. Otherwise, it's possible that two pieces of equipment may have different voltages on the chassis and touching both of them can deliver a shock. Also, never defeat the three wire AC plug by cutting off the ground pin. It's there for your safety. This slide shows how to connect all the equipment grounding points to the same common point. Don't connect from one piece of equipment to the next piece, but run an independent wire from each ground lug to the common point. Ground bus bars like the one in the picture are not expensive. It can be purchased at Home Depot or at Lowe's or at any home improvement center. Flat copper strap gives the lowest impedance to RF signals which means it'll, the RF will happily travel on that, on that strap to ground. Copper braid is almost as good and is good enough and it's far less expensive. And that's what I use in my shack. Grounding wires should be kept as short as possible so they don't act as receiving or transmitting antennas. Also run the ground wires without sharp corners. When RF energy comes to a sharp corner, it'll make its own decision on where to go next. Fuses are another critically important safety factor. Every piece of equipment should have its own fuse. If a fuse blows, there's probably a reason. Find and fix the problem and then replace the fuse. Electrical energy flowing through the human body will cause tissue to heat up, will disrupt the electrical function of cells, and will cause involuntary muscle contractions. You may not be able to let go. If you have a lead acid battery in your car, many hands use similar batteries in their portable operations. If the terminals in a lead acid battery are shorted together, the battery will give up all of its energy right now in milliseconds all of it. The battery, depending on the size, may overheat and catch fire. It will definitely emit hydrogen gas, which is flammable, and it may explode. Take care with batteries to be certain the terminals can't be accidentally shorted by dropping a wrench or a piece of wire or some other circumstance. Eventually, every amateur radio operator wants a tower of some sort because antennas higher are just better. Maybe just a mast up 30 feet or a tower like the one in the picture. Towers must be treated as though they can fall at any time and take you with it. In the past couple of years, several amateur radio operators have been killed or seriously injured by their towers. Some of them were free climbing, that is with no safety harness. Some didn't double click, that is use two safety lines such that one is always attached to the tower when moving up or down the tower. Others have disconnected the guy wires incorrectly while working on the tower and then ridden the tower to the ground with fatal consequences. There are some important safety precautions concerning towers. 
Keep a tower far enough away from a power line so that if the power falls, no part of it can come closer than 10 feet to the power line. Always use a safety harness, one that is rated for your weight and one that the date hasn't expired. Safety harnesses do have a specific useful life and an expiration date. Always have a helper and an observer on the ground and listen to that person regarding unsafe practices. The ground observer needs to wear a hard hat and have safety glasses on because things just kind of tend to fall. Don't climb crank up towers, even if the safety locking devices are set. I would recommend using a man lift. A gym pole is often used to lift tower sections or antennas into position. An example of a gym pole is on the next slide. Guy wires or guy ropes usually have turnbuckles to keep the tension on the guy wire. Wind will cause the guy wires to vibrate and the turnbuckles may loosen. There are safety wires that can be used to prevent the turnbuckle from coming loose. Local electrical codes govern tower grounding requirements. No federal agency is involved with tower grounding requirements. Generally speaking, separate eight foot long ground rods buried in the ground are needed for each tower leg, bonded to the tower and to each other. A gin pole? Here's one type. There are other kinds as well. If lightning strikes your antenna directly, all bets are off. However, nearby lighting, lightning strikes will definitely impact your station. The device in the picture provides excellent protection from high static electricity discharges and nearby lightning strikes. The coax from the antenna runs down to the lightning surge protector and a second piece of coax goes from the protector to your radio or antenna tuner. And then a ground wire goes from the plug down to your grounding rod in the ground. A sudden surge of electrical energy will cause the device to open the connection to the house and short the antenna to ground. If there is lightning in the area, I always disconnect my antenna even though I have lightning surge protectors. I also unplug my radio so static electricity can't come in over that house electrical wiring. And just as an aside, the American Radio Relay League, ARRL, has a, a provision to uh, insure your amateur radio equipment because most likely your homeowner's insurance will not cover it. RF energy is indeed energy. The amount of RF energy and the frequency of the energy determine how much effect the RF energy will have on the human body. The body is most susceptible to frequencies of about 50 megahertz or six meters. This frequency has the lowest maximum permissible exposure. If you have a radio emitting 50 watts or more of power, the FCC requires you to do an RF exposure evaluation and redo it if anything in your radio or antenna changes. There are three ways to do the exposure evaluation. You can use the information tables and steps outlined on FCC OET Bulletin 65. You can use one of several computer models available on the internet or with actual measurements using calibrated equipment. I use one of the computer models on the internet. I keep the evaluation information in my station log, which is just a regular notebook where I record any changes to my station configuration, antenna setup, control operator changes, or anything else interesting. The computer models ask for information about your transmitter, the length of feed line, the antenna location and height above the ground, distance from the antenna to neighbors and family, It'll then provide information on how far away people and animals should be from the antenna. Mobile radios with roof-mounted antennas running more than 50 watts of power need to be carefully modeled, particularly if small children are riding in the car, as roof-mounted antennas tend to be over the back seat of the car. 
if an antenna is going to be placed where people or animals can actually come in contact with the antenna, safety precautions should be employed to clearly mark the antenna with barriers to keep people away. RF energy is non-ionizing radiation. It cannot do genetic damage. But at the right frequency and power levels, it can result in burns, heart attacks, or involuntary muscle contractions. How do you go about managing RF exposure? The amount of RF energy and the length of the exposure are the primary components to be managed. You will seldom be transmitting for lengthy periods of time without stopping to listen. The duty cycle is the percentage of time that the transmitter is transmitting versus the time that it is not. If you're having a voice contact with someone, the duty cycle will be around 30% or perhaps even less. Some digital modes may go as high as a 50% duty cycle. For the technician class license exam, you need to know the definitions of duty cycle and power density. You also need to know that the duty cycle directly affects the power density. For your general class and particularly amateur extra class exams, you will need to fully understand how to manage RF exposure through the application of power density. So as an aside and as a quick overview, the information you need to consider is the average amount of RF power exposure over a period of time over a distance. If I'm using a single sideband emissions transmitter with a peak power output of 100 watts on a 30% duty cycle, I can calculate the power density and RF exposure in this fashion. A single sideband emission has a, is an amplitude modulated signal, only emitting 100 watts of power at the peak amplitude. On the average, a peak output of 100 watts single sideband results in an average output of 75 watts. Over a 10 minute period at a duty cycle of 30%, I'd be transmitting this average of 75 watts for 3.3 minutes, giving a power density of 24.75 watts in that 10 minute period. The effect of that power diminishes by the square of the distance. The further away the antenna is, the lower the RF exposure. A 100 watt single sideband station has almost a negligible power density, unless you are crouching directly under a low antenna. However, if I'm a big gun running a 1,500 watt amplifier on a 50% digital mode duty cycle, I would definitely need to take antenna placement into consideration to minimize the power density and RF energy exposure. This concludes video 21 on the topic of safety. Just be safe. At this point, you've gone through all of the videos in the license exam preparation series. If you've been diligent in working with hamstudy.org and are now taking and regularly passing their practice exams, you're ready to take the exam and be awarded your technician class for an amateur radio license. There's a fee to take the test of $14. If you don't pass the test, you can immediately take it again for another $14. The test is 35 questions long, and you need a score of 70% or better to pass. That means you can miss up to nine questions. We have no way to tell you what questions you missed. If you pass the technician class exam, you can take the general class exam at no additional cost. I recommend taking the test whether you've studied for it or not, just to see what the topics in the test covers. Who knows, and you may just pass it. You'll need two forms of identification. One must have your picture, such as a driver's license, a work ID badge, or a passport. The other can be any form of identification, such as a utility bill. In the exam session, you may have a calculator or two sheets of paper as scratch paper. The exam is administered on the computer. If you've taken a hamstudy.org practice exam, the actual exam will look almost the same. 
there will be three volunteer examiners proctoring the test. Each of them have to agree that the exam was properly administered with no abnormalities. They will sign the paperwork. You'll need to register for the exam prior to the exam session. You'll do the registration on the hamstudy.org website. Sign in to or just open hamstudy.org. In the upper right screen, click on Find a Session. Scroll down until you find the session for your exam. Your exam team will email you the particulars to find the correct session. You'll need your social security number to complete the registration. A part of the registration process is to obtain from the FCC an FCC record number or an FRN. So your browser will be sent from hamstudy.org to the FCC registration system to get the FRN. Once you have that number, you'll enter it into the hamstudy.org system to complete the registration. During the registration process, you'll be asked if you've ever been convicted of a felony. Be honest, and a misdemeanor is not a felony. Having been convicted of a felony does not preclude you from getting an amateur radio license. It just requires additional paperwork. And with that, we're almost finished. Note any questions or concerns to be discussed during our last online session or email them to me at rolandksmith at gmail.com. We'll see you online and at the exam session.